Um, so I'm very happy to welcome Tom Rosenstiel. He's the former executive director of the American Press Institute, um, the founder of Pew Research Center's Project for Excellence in Journalism, and the co-author of The Elements of Journalism, which we just uh, cited in our guide. Um, he's currently the Eleanor Merrill Visiting Professor of the Future of Journalism at the University of Maryland's Philip Merrill College of Journalism. Oh, thank you, Tom. Hi, everybody here and everybody watching. Um, somehow we gave this uh, talk the title, uh, Does uh, Truth Have a Future? I'm quite sure how I got talked into that. Uh, in 44 years as a professional journalist, I've learned one thing above all. Only a fool predicts the future. Uh, but I'm here. I came, wasn't that easy. My ticket got messed up at the airport. I, getting into Canada wasn't uh, uh, that easy. <laughs> but I don't know whether that's because I'm an American or what, but it was really hard. Uh, so in the next few minutes, I hope if not to predict the future, at least to offer some ideas about what might make it better. Does truth have a future? I think that depends on people in journalism being a lot better about what we do than we have been before. I wanna seven, suggest seven ways that I think we could do that. And now I have slide envy because I wish I had you know, a slide here with seven things on it. First, what do we mean by truth? It's not moral truth in journalism. It is factual truth a kind of physical truth. It is the truth of what we can prove, not what we believe in our hearts. It's not the truth of the meaning of life. It's not a personal truth. It's a truth ground in evidence and facts. It's the truth that we can prove. Now, how do we get closer to that? The first thing we need to do is be much more precise in the language we use about journalism and do a much better job of following through on the language we use if we want people to trust us. What do I mean by that? We throw a lot of words around about journalism and we expect people to understand us. We don't even agree on what these terms mean ourselves. Let me point out some of these words that we misuse. It's pretty accepted in this business that you can't just give people the facts in isolation, that um, you have to give people context about the facts for them to make sense. Uh, otherwise, the facts themselves are random and can be pulled out of context. So we use that word a lot, context, context. What do we mean by context in journalism? I think in practice, we're really sloppy about that. And with good reason, a lot of people in the public who by in survey after survey tell us, just give me the facts, say that when we wanna add context, they think we mean, oh yeah, you wanna slide in your opinion. Read any newspaper, website, let alone, I shudder, watch cable TV, a lot of what we label as news today is a lot more than what I would call context. Here is my definition of context. I think journalistic context means adding to stories more facts surrounding the original, well, I've, I've already screwed this up. Adding context to stories means surrounding the facts we report with other facts that help our audience understand that for themselves, what has happened, the, the event, the phenomenon, whatever we're reporting on. Adding context to stories means surrounding the facts we report with additional facts. It does not involve telling the audience what to think or what things mean or adding our speculation about uh, why something happened or where things are going. 
Let me give you an example. Imagine a report. You have a prime minister in this country. Right? We'll make this about it. I knew that. Imagine a report about what the prime minister said today. Useful context might be the fact that this was a change from what he has been saying in the, in the days before. And that today's statement is not entirely supported by the facts. And that a lot of people in his party had hoped he wouldn't say what he did today. And that his political opponents are now licking their chops because he did say it. And still others think that all of this is a tempest in a teapot and in 24 hours, nobody's gonna care. Those are all facts that we can verify and report. What is not context? That the prime minister seems to have a psychological need to exaggerate or that he always looks frightened when under pressure or that there's just something about him that seems insincere. That's commentary or speculation. It's certainly opinion, but it's not even analysis. Sometimes we can fuse context with speculation. Why did the prime minister say what he did today? Well, some journalists think that because you really can't know that, the bar for something like that, for, re for writing about motive, strategy is lower because who can say you were wrong? I think the opposite is true. I think the bar is higher. I think as we enter what I call the interior of the news into the realm of motive, implications, future consequences, the bar of evidence needs to be higher. The more reporting we have to do, the more evidence we must show, the more transparent we, we must be, precisely because these things are harder to know. Even if the evidence is past history and is empirical, we have to show that, not just tell it. We have to back up that with facts. What's the difference between context versus analysis? And what's the difference between analysis versus commentary and opinion? If we can't tell the difference or we're sloppy in our use of that, how can we expect the public to understand it? That leads to my second point. We need to stop, if we need to be more precise in our language, we also need to stop cheapening the language and acting like politicians who use language to manipulate people to get their attention. What do I mean by that? An interview is not an exclusive. If the same person is being interviewed by a lot of other people on the same day, that's just an interview. Yes, it's different than a press conference, maybe even a, than a group interview, but it's not an exclusive. And when you say an interview is an exclusive and the same person's talking all over the place, we look like liars. Example number two, a story happened two hours ago, is not breaking news, it's just news. <laughs> and something that happened during the day is not happening tonight just because you're standing in the dark in front of a building. <laughs> the more we do this kind of thing, the more we erode, it while, be, while we think we're getting people's attention, the more we erode our authority to claim to be more truthful than the people who we're competing against who are less truthful. <laughs> the more we cheapen language, use it for our own devices, the more we lose our authority. People laugh at us. They consider us phonies who are just in it for the money and we're fooling ourselves. Point number three. Those of you who know my work won't be surprised by what I'm about to say. The biggest place where we are sloppy in our thinking in journalism is around the concept of objectivity. Too many people in journalism say that objective, use the word objective journalism to mean neutral. Objectivity does not mean neutrality. I, might, I could just stay, say, stand up here and say this for five minutes straight. To, to make the point strong enough, objectivity is not neutrality. The term objectivity comes from science and social science. 
And in science, objectivity means using an objective method, a scientific method for gathering evidence and testing your evidence and your hypothesis. A scientist isn't neutral. They have a hypothesis that they are testing. They are objective in process, in how they explore evidence. They are not ciphers. They do not have a view from nowhere. It is not the erasure of the self. In fact, the objective method begins by starting, uh, by identifying what's my initial view? What are my initial suspicions? What is my hypothesis? It also includes looking at yourself culturally and saying, what are the limitations of my understanding of this? So rather than claiming that or erasing the self and having a view from nowhere, identifying where your view starts is the first essential step of an objective process. And the more objective your process, the more transparent you can be about it because the more you can share it with uh, uh, the audience. Objectivity in journalism does not mean that you don't draw conclusions or that you're absolutely neutral or that you give two sides equal weight, nor does it mean you have no point of view. It means you have used rigorous methods to report the news that you can share. It's much closer to our modern definition of transparency than it is to neutrality. Objective journalism is true to the facts true to the facts. You are faithful to the facts. Did Biden win the presidential election in 2020? Is the science behind global warming well-established? Is climate change behind our intensifying, intensifying weather, fires in the West, growing drought? Objective journalism would not be neutral about these things because there's a preponderance of facts. And that's where we owe our allegiance. In long form journalism, such as magazine pieces or a nonfiction book, the highest compliment indeed we can pay the authors of that work is to say, you know, I loved your book. I disagreed with your conclusion about this, this, and this, because they presented so the evidence uh, so well and 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 in a way that is credible that I can separate their excellent reporting from the conclusions that they've drawn from that reporting. It ain't neutral. It's authoritative, and um, I know when they've shifted from showing me evidence. And that kind of work, by the way, leaves room for that. It doesn't, it's not, the evidence is not marshaled for an argument. The evidence is marshaled for examination and the conclusions drawn separately. That's good journalism. That's objective journalism. Okay, point number four. If we want people to trust us as fact-based journalists, we need to start calling out the bad journalism and some of it ain't journalism. There are multiple models of news today out there and they are not all equally good. And some of them are practiced by supposedly serious news operations. What do I mean by that? Well, the classic models that we operate in, the journalism of verification, which uh, we talked about in the fact checking, there's the journalism of explanation, what we call explanatory journalism, which is a variant of the journalism of verification. But now you're explaining things more. You're not just reporting facts. There's investigative journalism, um, exposés, watchdog journalism, deeply grounded in verification, but more prosecutorial and, and then strictly uh, repertorial. We may, you, you're making a case. You're pointing out and saying, um, Alan Thompson stole money is a bad guy and should be in jail. Um, but there's also what I would call a, a, a sort of growing area. It's not new, but it's growing that I would call the journalism of alarmism or attention getting. We're in the attention marketplace. There's too much journalism out there vying for people's attention. Even done by news organizations that are supposedly serious. In America, we see it in the United States. We see it on the nightly news every night. It's not just hyping stories to sound more important than they are. The journalism of alarmism also means telling me essentially the same story over and over and over night after night with new facts from a new place, but no new understanding. Terrible weather in Memphis. 
Next day, it's terrible weather in Nashville. The next day, it's terrible weather in um, Biloxi. But there's never an, an effort to move uh, beyond that and say, what's going on? Night after night, I'm seeing the weatherman tell me about terrible weather. I, you need to go deeper. All you're doing is animating me. All you're doing is jacking me up, but you're not helping me. That's a journalism of alarmism. And it's designed to get ratings, but it is not designed to do the things that, this, that better journalism uh, are designed to do, which is to help me as a citizen, help me as a member of the audience, help me live my life. It's not serving me. It's manipulating me. There's also what I would call um, uh, the journal that uh, what I would have called the journalism of affirmation. That's a journalism model that builds an audience by reaffirming what that audience already believes. We see lots of it on cable news in the United States. Um, it, uh, it happens with, on Fox in the US. It happens on MSNBC in the uh, US. They are in the entertainment and comfort business more than the information business. Um, what's important to know about the journalism of affirmation is, however, that the forces, the magnetic pull of, of the journalism of affirmation is getting stronger. And the economics of all national news are pulling even good publications in that direction. Why? Because you can become a prisoner to your audience. If you're a national news outlet, you are already in a marketplace where you have a small subset of a national audience. At the, in, in, in the United States, the New York Times tends to have a liberal audience. And as they watch their engagement numbers and see what registers, and you know, in the, in the lobby of the Washington Post, they can tell you, as you walk in, they'll tell you what story is most popular on their website. Right there, it's on a banner in the, in the, in the lobby. You can be the gravitational pull is to give the audience, your existing audience, more of what they want. And in the realm of politics, that is to affirm the things they already believe. So make no mistake, while Fox is built around this model, there are strong undercurrents pulling the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the, 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 even the, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel or any other paper, to deliver to its audience what will provide them with comfort and affirmation. That's especially true in national media. And if we are not aware of it, we will see more of it. Point number five is related to this. And it's about how supposedly serious journalism has now become engaged in enabling polarization and extremism. Why do we do this? Well, there are studies in the United States that have shown that television, both broadcast and cable, has uh, a penchant for putting the most extreme politicians on the air, uh, overrepresenting them, and creating the impression that members of Congress are either extremely liberal or extremely conservative um, and, and very inflammatory in their rhetoric. People in the middle who may make up the majority of U.S. senators and even U.S. House members are not getting on TV because they are pretty cautious and they don't say, say things that are as inflammatory. The effect of this for a politician, particularly on cable news, which is on all the time, airtime is oxygen. Airtime translates into having a higher profile, to being able to raise more money for your pack, to having you're being on your way to moving from a state legislator to a house member, to a senator, to aspiring to be a governor or, or a, a presidential candidate. Airtime is oxygen. And if the oxygen is given to extremists at the exclusion of other politicians, the press is no longer an observer of this process. It is an empowerer of it, an empowerer of it. I need to write easier to say words. Um, <laughs> We need to be aware of this because over-indexing extremists on our broadcasts and in our content is a form of distortion. It's inaccurate, but it's also pulling politicians who might've been uh, uh, standing in one place and saying, the only way I'm going to get ahead is by becoming more extreme. That's the way I get on television. Um, so we are not 
uh, observers, mere observers of, of this phenomenon, we need to recognize that. And I think we need to stop it. My sixth point is also related to this. We are taught in journalism, make it simple, make it easy for people to understand. What we have begun to do in these complicated times is take the complexity out of po particularly political dialogue and the uh, majority of, I think, of our citizens no longer see themselves in our political news. They see people over here who are wild and they see people over here who are also wild and then they see leadership who are trying to keep, keep their power by navigating the, the wild extremes on both ends of, of, their, uh, of their parties. Um, and, um, you know, they don't see themselves. Liberals think this, conservatives think this, the black community thinks this, the indigenous community thinks this, the Muslim community thinks that. All of those are stereotypes. All of those are statements that are almost certainly wrong. By compressing and oversimplifying and categorizing in, in overgeneralized ways, we are leaving people out of the news. One of the most um, important things that I've read in recent years is a piece by my friend Amanda Ripley called Complicating the Narratives. It's an essay in Medium. What Amanda did is she went to conflict mediators and said, how do you talk to people in marriages and in really polarized situa situations where they begin to hear each other again? And she took these techniques and said, okay, how would I translate these into journalism? And basically said, we need to make particularly our political discourse more complicated. We need to stop creating two points of view and really listen to uh, uh, the people who, who disagree and see and understand them much, uh, much more. Interview them, not in a transactional way. I need a quote. Let's, let's get somebody from the right to say something, you know, like that's really gonna pop and instead say, go interview a bunch of senators and try and figure out you know, where they are on this and represent that so that those dynamics, even among professional politicians, can be portrayed. And my seventh point, my last point is about truth. Our job as journalists, the reason we exist the reason that journalism came out of the enlightenment was to create a, a common public square of public knowledge, a place where people could gather and uh, have information so that they could help, they could solve problems for themselves. Journalism is inextricably linked, uh, linked <laughs> with democracy. We are a democratizing force in a society. And the freer our press is, the more democratic our societies are. But to do that, we have to create a common, a, a public square, a common public square, a common set of facts that make sense to a wide portion of our population. We cannot exclude or write off large sections of the public that we serve. We need to find a way to explain to people who misapprehend facts why they are wrong in a way that will help them understand them. We need to understand more about neuroscience and the psychology of information and how people receive information. We, need, we spend all our time in journalism because of our history, learning how to dig things up and then write them down. And we think our job is done. The people who are engaged in disinformation and misinformation campaigns and polarization campaigns spend all their time studying how people receive information and how to manipulate them by using that science. We need to get into the game of understanding how people receive information if we want to be able to provide what we think is accurate information to them in a way that they will believe. If QAnon is persuading people and journalism is not, Part of that is on us to understand the way people use information and, and the psychology of it. So to sum, to sum up, find the good stuff that you can verify. Point stuff out that you can't verify. 
show the proof of what you've done. Understand the audience who is suspicious of you. They think you're either too liberal or too racist. They have looked at your history. They've seen your weaknesses. Their suspicions are grounded in history about us. And some of it is justified. And you do that by talking to them, by, by genuinely trying to understand the audiences that we have failed to understand or have harmed. Make the wider world understandable to a wider world of audience, not just the world who already reads us. Ideology is a theory about how the world works. We are not in the ideology business. We are in the reality business. And reality, the gathering of facts, rarely, rarely neatly fits into the theory of how the world works. Our job is in tru as truth tellers is to capture reality. And that's not simple. And it doesn't necessarily lead to clarity. It may lead to complexity. And we need to, if, if, future, if truth is to have a future, we need to find better ways to deal with complexity. And that starts with our being a lot more rigorous about our own language and our own practices. Trying to sell people on what we've always done in the past will not work. Understanding the failures of what we've done in the past and addressing them is an essential first step. Thank you. We have about six minutes for questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, it's your fault. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so my question was, so you were talking about losing authority um, when it comes to when we report stories and we want to look, make ourselves look better, but then what it's actually doing is taking us further from the truth. Um, and this has kind of affected the reputation of journalism as an industry. And so my question is, how do we restore this trust from the public, especially from um, communities that are marginalized? Uh, well, I think there's a couple of things. The first one is, uh, we have, as I said at the end, we need to go talk to uh, and listen um, and, um, and let people get their anger off their chest. Um, uh, and, and make it be clear that you actually are there to, to learn, to learn, not just to listen. The second thing is, I think a big word in journalism that we, that certainly wasn't used when I was in journalism school is humility. Recognizing what we do not know is an essential part of my thinking about the objective process. Um, you have to identify what it is you don't know. You have to go into situations and when people, um, uh, when you're talking to people, uh, don't pretend you understand them. Uh, do the opposite. Um, say, please ex explain to me, tell me a little more about what you mean. Amanda Ripley in this, her work on complicating narratives says, when she interviews somebody, she'll, she now parrots back to them. So let me see if I got this right. You said, blah, 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 blah. and if they say, and then she watches for cues on how they react to her paraphrasing. And if they say, um, yeah, she'll say, I, I think I'm missing something. Explain it to me again, which we don't usually do, right? Explain it to me again. I wasn't really, couldn't really get that. Um, or they'll say, that's right, that's right. And then she'll say, well, tell me more. So her interviews are a process of opening people up, not, Oh, good. Got the quote. I'm almost out of here. So those are two. I mean, it's a big question that you've asked, but you have to, you know, I, I would say this. Our dist distrust of us is usually about intent. Do they doubt? Are they suspicious of our intentions? Often that can be ground in execution and harm that was done a long time ago. But it's uh, but a lot of it is um, uh, they just think, well, you say you're doing this, but you're clearly a liar because of the stories you've done in the past. They're, they will forgive the stories in the past, 
I think, if they think you're sincere about changing. Uh, we have a question from someone on Zoom. We're going to try and get them up. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but I can see you. And um, I'm, I'm Susanna Siegel. I'm not a journalist. I'm actually a philosopher. And um, I wanted to uh, comment and maybe ask you what you think about a thought um, prompted by your last number seven um, of studying how people receive information. So I'm actually a philosopher of mine. This is part of what I study. Um, but the comment is really about the thought that um, a lot of people who are drawn into what we consider you know, conspiracy theories or um, even things that are much milder than conspiracy theories have an incredibly participatory model. So you've heard this mantra, probably do your own research. And there's this fantastic new ethnography by an uh, ethnographer called Francesca Tripodi called The Propagandist Playbook, where she embedded with people in um, uh, North Carolina, um, you know, for and only took in what they took in for uh, several months. And, um, and, and what she found was that drawing in the sort of um, model of actually in white evangelical um, spaces where you do your own research, you like interpret the text. What she found was that people were looking at Prager U, you know, the so-called university, a whole series of YouTube um, videos and not just one source, but many, many sources. So what you can't see from these population level studies um, of propaganda, but you can see from ethnography is just how long some of these lines of inquiry are. And it's not because they're necessarily like QAnon where it's gamified and they're going down this big rabbit hole. It's not even a rabbit hole, really. You know, it's just that they look at this, they look at that. And because of the, because the um, kind of informational universe from their point of view is actually very varied. They feel like they're fact checking. They are feel like they are getting verified information, but most importantly, I think they feel like they're inquiring. And so what that makes me wonder is whether in journalism, this kind of journalism, verification based journalism, what was there space for sort of saying for more information, look here, <laughs> or you know, giving people more of that sense of I am doing my own research. And maybe that's a sort of intermediate stepping stone of regaining trust. So it's not just that, you know, you have to say it in the right way so people just believe you, but rather you, you're saying it in such a way that they feel like they are somehow, you know, able to do their own inquiry, but get to a good place. Yeah, I think you're, you're on to something. Um, uh, we have a public uh, uh, documentary uh, series in, in our public media called um, uh, um, uh, 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 Frontline. And at Frontline, they embrace what they call radical transparency. Uh, and on their website, the materials that they use, the raw materials and their full interviews and all everything that they used or cited in a documentary is available on, online. Um, I'm not saying that their approach to radical transparency is, is perfect, but um, it is an attempt to recognize that journalism, as you know, was said 20 years ago, needs to stop being a lecture and be a conversation. That conversation, notion of conversation needs to be more sophisticated than the comment stream. Uh, it really is a conversation in which the audience is actively seeking out their own information. One other thing very quickly, there's research that out of England that um, uh, there's a lot of research that people who believe in false theories don't want to be misled. In fact, they've embraced false theories because they think the, the media is lying to them. And so they're searching for um, what they consider to be the truth. Um, but that if you, if you teach people how to identify disinformation for themselves, uh, uh, that's some name like pre-blocking or pre um, Pre-bunking, I think, is the term that has been thrown. It's not a great term. But you teach people how to spot the kind of the grammar of disinformation, um, that that's pretty effective and actually more effective than telling people this information has been debunked. That post-labeling actually has the opposite effect. It drives people to <laughs> information um, in the same way that you can teach people to identify spam to you know clean up their their email. Do we have a couple time for a couple more? I know we started late. One that's very, very quick um, because we're cutting into coffee. So more questions, oh, less comments. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty quick. It should take more than two hours. <laughs> it is a college. Yeah. There is kind of a, oh, that, th there is sort of a, 
sorry. Um, uh, there is sort of a, I think, expectation of goodwill on the part of citizenry um, in the, the model that you're describing, because it assumes that people are willing to, be, um, to enhance their understanding of issues. Um, my concern is that, uh, for example, we have very prominent politicians in this country that have basically said they're no longer going to deal with the mainstream media. And I know it's happened in the United States as well. Um, so the idea of goodwill that, um, uh, that they will listen intently to quality journalism and be moved by its evidence, um, it's hard to imagine any of that penetrating when there are, um, you know, there's a political calculation here about getting people to herd around misinformation or um, an ideology. How do we deal with that if you put all your effort into producing quality journalism, but they actually just reject it by definition? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah, we'll need two hours on that one. Um, you know, I, I think some of this has to do with uh, recognizing that our work is not just the beautiful piece that we wrote. Now, our work is also the evidence that we assembled and that we share in other spaces. And it may be the, you know, you, we, you may have done a great investigation uh, uh, um, uh, that involved a lot of components, but it, it also includes a key piece of video. That key piece of video that, you know, you e examined or the document that you unearthed and then examined um, is much more likely today to be read in the raw than it would have been, you know, when it was hard for the newspaper or the TV program to deliver that um, for, for people. Um, you know, we, we have the ability to footnote our work effectively in uh, online. And so, you know, we need to recognize our, our initial piece is a, is a synopsis, a synopsis of the evidence and, and the more we can share the evidence. That is not a perfect answer. Um, but uh, the other thing I think we need to recognize is that we are putting, that we all have, we have always been, but are even more so part of an ecosystem that we, we report a story. I mean, newspapers in the United States have been an elite medium for uh, 60 years. You know, when I worked at the Los Angeles Times, only 25% of the households in, in LA bought the newspaper. Um, rich people bought the newspaper because that's the only people that our advertisers cared about. But lots of things that went into the New York, into the LA Times ended up on television in LA because it echoed out through the ecosystem. So that's the other thing I think we, we should be mindful of is building our journalism in a way that it does echo out where the pieces are there. Um, uh, and today that also means, you know, uh, I mean, at the University of Maryland where I teach, um, you know, uh, how, how would you tell this story from the Washington Post on TikTok? Um, that may be the only thing that someone sees, but it also may be, it may lead them back to a different piece in the Washington Post. But um, uh, the, I guess the third component of this, to this answer that's an insufficient answer is we meet people where they are. We have to meet people where they are. Uh, the, the, to, to, to do what you're suggesting, and it will not be 100% successful, we have, to be, uh, we have to be audience first, audience centric, not mobile first, not digital first, not social first. We, we are where the audience is because it is our job to serve them with accurate information. Easier said than done. Now you go figure out how to do it. <laughs> Um, thank you so much again. Thank you.